Hello everyone and welcome to the night sky. I'm Adam Woodworth and we're going to go through a complete Milky Way crash course here in this webinar. Whether you're completely new to night photography or you've been doing it for a while, you should learn a whole lot here. We're going to cover a lot of techniques from getting started with camera gear all the way to advanced shooting techniques. Um, I've been doing night photography for about 12 years now, which is kind of an, an eternity in the world of landscape astrophotography. Um, cameras have only sort of recently caught up with the ability to do it really, um, you know, cleanly with a lot less noise and issues than before. Um, so I hope you enjoy this webinar and learn a whole lot. And if you're not familiar with me, uh, just a little bit about me first. Um, I wrote one of the original tutorials on the topic of landscape, landscape astrophotography in uh, Outdoor Photography Magazine, as well as on Luminous Landscape. Um, I've written articles on the topic in other magazines like Digital Photo, Digital Photo Pro. Um, I've spoken on the Nikon stage at a few of their expos in Photo Plus in New York City and CES in Las Vegas. Um, I produce tutorials and teach workshops in landscape astrophotography, and um, I have a new book out on the subject. It's called Night Sky Photography from First Principles to Professional Results. You can find it anywhere books are sold. It's, of course, available on Amazon, and I've heard of people all over the world ordering it from Amazon US and getting it shipped to wherever they are, even if it's not available in their country. It is available in um, French and German now, so um, you can look for your, your dealers there in those countries to find that version of the book. And it's available in an ebook and PDF, uh, an ebook and a hard copy. But I definitely recommend a hard copy. It looks way more um, beautiful than the uh, the ebook. It's just very simple. But they really did a good job laying out the uh, hard copy printed version. And of course, um, some of you may be familiar with my Milky Way Masterclass video tutorials that goes through everything I do for editing photos from start to finish with star stacking and exposure blending and all that stuff. So maybe you know me from there. Um, so we're going to focus on capturing pinpoint stars with the Milky Way over dramatic landscapes in this webinar. It's not going to be about star trails, um, but the methods that you see here can be applied to any star shots without the Milky Way, whether the Milky Way is in it or not. The techniques are all the same. Um, and all the shots that you see in this in the webinar, all my shots, they're all um, created from photos in the same spot on the same night without moving the camera. The photos usually consist of multiple exposures because of the limitations of cameras, but they're all shot in the same night and the same spot without moving the camera. Um, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, this is an example of what goes into a lot of my photos. Um, you have the sky shot, a foreground shot, and a finished edit. So. What's going on here? Why is there so much? Uh, why do you need different exposures? Well, we're limited in our shutter speed because of the movement of the Earth. So the stars will uh, streak and, and cause trailing if the exposure time is too long. So that's great for the stars. You can get a, uh, you know, you can use an appropriate shutter speed for the stars, but then you're ended up, you end up with a very dark foreground depending on where you're shooting. So then maybe you need a separate foreground exposure to get any sort of usable detail in the foreground. And then you blend those together later in software. We'll get into the details of more of this later, but I just wanted to lay out kind of where we're going here. Um, now, most of my shots are all blends like that, where you take a star shots, you take foreground shots, all in the same spot in the same night, and then blend them for very high uh, quality images. But that doesn't mean that you can't do a single exposure, you know, a single shot of a scene to get the night sky and a foreground. It just depends on where you are, how much ambient light there is in the foreground, whether you're maybe adding your own light or not. Um, I tend not to do that, but you can certainly uh, use some low level lighting to light up the scene, or maybe you're at a lighthouse or something where there's plenty of ambient light anyway. So in those situations, you could literally just get by with a single shot um, you'll still have a lot more noise in the sky versus star stacking, a technique I'll discuss later. But if that's all you want to do and you're just posting to Instagram or making very small prints, then, you know, just about 20 to 30 seconds, ISO 3200 to 6400, widest aperture on your lens and the widest focal length. And there you go. That's the basics. Um, but if you want high quality images, you know, low noise in the sky, sharp foregrounds and stuff like that, there's more to it. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, an idea of what went into that uh, photo I just showed you, on um, the, the raw image looks like the photo on the left, 
and then the edited image looks like the photo on the right. So even if you're just doing a single shot, there's still going to be some editing involved for sure to get the image to really pop and come to life. Um, and you can just see how dark it was at that location and how much detail I was able to bring out of it. That said, this photo probably doesn't show up on the on the webinar here, but it's actually quite noisy and there's a lot of color noise, especially in the foreground. Certainly fine for like small prints and stuff like that, but we can get we can do better. Um, so let's talk about camera gear before we get into the details of exposures and stuff like that. Um, the full frame cameras will certainly do better, but over the recently um, recent years, uh, crop, crop cameras have come a long ways and are much better than they used to be. Um, and you know, I teach workshops and I see lots of different cameras come through my workshops and everything from you know micro four thirds cameras to APS-C cameras to full frame cameras and they're all um, they all work great obviously full frame is going to be the best but anything does really good these days any modern recent camera will do a very good job um, for you with capturing the night sky so you basically just start with whatever you, whatever you have most likely there's even some phones that can capture the night sky now but that's not what we're talking about here um, lenses of course uh, ultra wides are going to be the most popular for this so that means like super wide angle like 14 millimeters on a full frame something like that um, that lets you capture a huge amount of the sky and the foreground in the same shot um, on full frame you're looking around 14 to 16 millimeters or so um, on crop cameras like APS-C crop it's probably 10 to 12 millimeters something like that and on micro four thirds, you might be looking at um, seven to eight millimeters in that area, depending on what's available. Um, but you can go certainly go longer focal lengths for, for landscape astro. You can certainly go up to 24 or 35. I've shot 50 millimeter shots with, with uh, the, the Milky Way, um, which works really great. Um, and usually you're looking for large aperture lenses like f2.8 or greater, but there's a little bit more detail to that um, we'll talk about in a second. But um, here's an example of, just to show you different focal length um, representations of the Milky Way, here's an example of a 14 millimeter shot with the Milky Way over a landscape. You can get a large amount of the sky, a large amount of the foreground in one shot. This is an example at 24 millimeters where you've got a much more punched in view of the galactic core of the Milky Way there. So a lot more detail in the sky where that uh, of the stars in the Milky Way there. It's a lot more in your face. And then here's a 58 millimeter shot of the Milky Way. And you can see how much way more detail we get with this. You can even bring out the colors and the nebulas that are up there. Um, and the, the core is literally like right in your face. Crazy, crazy. This is a real shot. It's just, um, you know, editing really brought out the stars, but it was a real shot. It's not fake. I didn't paste in the Milky Way there. It's the real deal. Um, so a little bit, a little bit more about lenses. Um, for full frame lenses, you're looking at like um, uh, various manufacturers have 14 to 24, 16 to 35, 15 to 30, like that range of lenses. Um, I know they're zoom lenses, but they're really good. There are primes available that you can certainly use. I use the Nikon 14 to 24 f2.8 lens. That's a great lens. Um, whether it's the F mount or the new Z mount, they're both really good. Um, for crop cameras, you're, you know, APS-C crop, you're looking at like, you know, things by Tokina and Rokinon. Um, one thing to consider to keep in mind is that even though a really fast lens might sound great like an f 1.8 lens it might be really bad with the stars like the sigma 14 millimeter f 1.8 lens is a good example of this sounds like a great lens for night photography because it's 14 millimeters and f 1.8 but the reality is is that f1 at f 1.8 that lens is actually really bad with stars the stars show up really distorted a lot of coma distortion on them but it looks great at f 2.8 so you know the lens works great at f 2.8 not so great at f 1.8 with stars so just keeping that keep that in mind when you're looking for um, lenses out there that just because it's a really fast aperture lens it might not work that well with stars you know they're they might look good on an instagram post or a small print but when you make a bigger print you'll see or look at it in your computer and zoom all the way in you'll just see how distorted the stars can sometimes be with really fast lenses and of course, it's important to have a, a good sturdy tripod in your head. You know, you're going to be out doing long exposures. Um, you want a good quality tripod under your camera.
Another piece of hardware that you'll need possibly is an intervalometer or some sort of bulb release. Um, you basically will need some way on your camera to take an exposure longer than 30 seconds if you're doing separate foreground exposures. Um, obviously for the star exposures you're looking at only like you know 10 to 30 seconds or something like that but if you're taking a separate foreground exposure you're going to need an ability to keep the shutter open longer than 30 seconds and a lot of cameras by default don't have any way to do that built in like the 30 seconds is the longest shutter speed built into most cameras but with an intervalometer um, an external shutter release you can plug it into your camera put the camera in bulb mode and then hold the shutter open as long as you need it. It's also really handy for uh, star stacking, a technique I'll talk about later, where you take a bunch of exposures in a row for, um, and then stack them later for low noise. So intervalometer comes in really handy there because you can program the camera to do it for you. But not all cameras need this. Like some cameras have an intervalometer built in, some cameras have a bulb timer built in, so you can go longer than 30 seconds, or the, just the, any ability to, to go past 30 seconds on the, on the timer dial. Some cameras have both. Some cameras have only one or the other. Um, a lot of the newer Nikon cameras have a built-in intervalometer and shutter speeds longer than 30 seconds if you put the camera into the right mode. A lot of newer Canon cameras have a bulb timer to let you plug in any time you want and a built-in intervalometer. Some Canons only have one or the other. Some Nikons only have an intervalometer built in. I didn't, some Sonys have an intervalometer built in but no bulb timer. Um, some cameras don't have either. So. Uh, see what's what's in your camera for you. Um, you'll definitely need some way to at least uh, keep the shutter open for longer than 30 seconds if you're doing photography in really dark areas where you want detail in a foreground. Uh, other pieces of equipment that are very handy, of course, headlamps, red LED headlamps, flashlights, and headlamps with a red LED mode. Uh, essential for um, the red LED doesn't harm your night vision as much. So once you're set up at your location. Um, you can switch on to your red LED and it'll be a lot less blinding on your on yourself and um, you'll be able to enjoy the night sky more while you're kind of rustling around in your bag and getting everything set up. And then a highly overlooked uh, piece of equipment but very important is something called a lens heater. Um, depending on where you're shooting this is going to be either um, not very important or completely critical to your success at night. Um, what happens at night is that, of course, the air temperature drops, and if there's any humidity in the air, it has a greater chance of settling on lenses and car hoods and picnic tables on the grass and, you know, forming dew. Um, when the dew that basically happens when the dew point and the ambient temperature get close together or meet, you're in the danger zone. And um, wide-angle lenses, like the front element of camera lenses, is just like a really nice spot where <laughs> dew likes to form. So if you're shooting in a humid climate and it's at night, in the summer particularly, there's a very good chance you're going to end up with moisture on the front of your lens and you'll need some way to counteract that. Um, I use an electric lens heater that wraps around the lens, connects to a USB battery pack, and it just heats the front of the lens there and that's all it is. Very simple, very effective. Um, you could wipe the lens when you see the problem, but by the time you see the problem, it's probably too late because once you wipe it, it'll be back. The moisture will almost always be back very quickly. You could use uh, little like chemical hand warmers that you might use for skiing or something like that. You can wrap them around the lens with a rubber band or, or some sort of fabric design for it, but they're hit and miss. You know, you don't always get a packet that works right. Sometimes it just doesn't work right, even though everything is warm enough. Uh, with those things. So I use an electric lens heater and if you're going to go out a lot, um, the purchase price of like a $20 lens heater and a $20 battery or whatever is going to easily um, uh, uh, pay for itself over buying chemical hand warmers over and over and over again. Um, so very important piece of equipment depending on where you're shooting. So let's talk about the uh, components that go into the images here. We talked a little bit about it already, but um, in most dark locations, a single exposure is simply not enough. There's just, you know, you can get plenty of, of detail in the sky in a exposure of like, say, 10 to 30 seconds where you're trying to limit star trails, but the foreground might be so completely useless and so dark that you need a separate exposure for the foreground. Um, I personally prefer the natural ambient light of the scene instead of adding my own light, and that could literally mean like, you know, no, like no light at all, it's just the starlight that's lighting the scene, 
or maybe there's like light pollution from a nearby town or a lighthouse right next to me that's causing that's lighting up the foreground like crazy just whatever lights there is what i work with uh personally but um so i will often you know if it's a really dark area i'll have a second exposure or multiple possibly more than one um, separate exposure um, with a lower ISO and a higher shutter speed just to get more detail in the foreground that you then blend in later. So again, this is the image I showed earlier in the webinar. We've got the sky, 10 seconds, at ISO 6400 on the left. The foreground is a shot at 10 minutes at ISO 1600. And these are all shot on my Nikon Z7 with a Nik Nikon 14-24 to f2.8 lens. Um, 14 millimeters and f2.8 for all shots. The uh, details of the you know exact shutter speed for the sky we'll talk about soon but the foreground shutter speed is basically going to be whatever it needs to be <laughs> for your location um, maybe there's enough ambient light that you can get away with like a 30 second or 60 second uh, foreground shot um, you do want to usually bring the ISO down um, I don't want to get too bogged down in and talking about uh, you know the physics of cameras but um, the ISO isn't really what causes noise in the camera and images, even though it, it's we often associate high ISO with high noise, it's really the fact that there's just less light hitting the scene. Um, so causing you to use a high ISO to boost the brightness of the image. But anyway, um, when you're using a, as long as the exposure time is long enough, you'll have um, a good amount of detail and lower noise. So it's just a matter of capturing enough light there. Um, so that's why in a dark location you might need to use as long as 10 minutes of a shutter speed to capture enough detail for it to be like clean and not super noisy. And in other areas, maybe it's only a minute or two or five, then you'll be plenty. It just depends on how much ambient light there is. So, of course, you don't have to do uh, all separate exposures all the time. You don't always have to have a separate foreground exposure. Um, depending on the composition, you know, silhouettes are good too. Um, you know, if it's whether it's just trees against the horizon or a place like this where I have rocks um, at, a, at some mud flats here and some trees in the far distant there, just a shoreline basically in complete shadow with a reflection of the Milky Way and the mud flats. Um, works really well here. I didn't think there'd be any benefit to having detail in the rocks and the trees here. Um, I really love the way the silhouette looks here, so that's why I didn't even bother with a separate foreground exposure for this. So it just depends what you're doing and, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, you can also shoot during twilight, or sometimes known as blue hour. Um, you'll have a whole hell of a lot more ambient light, so your foreground exposures, if you take a separate one, don't need to be as long usually, or you can stop the lens down, get more in focus, you know, f4, f5, 6, or something like that. Long, uh, get a wider, uh, deeper depth of field, sharper image. Maybe you still have to shoot pretty long, several minutes or whatever, but you do it in one shot instead of multiple shots where you have to focus stack or something like that. Um, it also, the th other thing I really like about shooting at twilight is that because the sky still has uh, the scattered blue light from the sun, it looks very blue. Depending on how deep into twilight you are, you'll either have like a very blue sky with like, you know, sort of a faint ghostly image of the Milky Way like you have, like I have here. Or it may be really deep into twilight and you can get a lot more detail in the Milky Way with still having a truly blue sky. And it's the way, it's a way to get like a nice night blue sky image without actually, f you know, faking the image to be blue. Like if the, if it's, you're in a true dark location and it's in the middle of the night and the moon's not up, the sky isn't supposed to be blue. It should be like kind of neutral in color between the stars if there's no air glow or something like that. Um, but you can use twilight to get truly blue, you know, actual sky, uh, night sky images. Um, here's another example of twilight. Um, and the reason I use twilight here is, well, first of all, I like the way it looks. We've got this nice blue sort of faint sky. But in some cases, you may run up against the fact that the, the where you're shooting there's just too much light pollution so that at night the sky kind of gets washed out or kind of brown and ugly you know yellowy colored from like the, the the light pollution from nearby towns but maybe the light pollution isn't enough that it ruins the twilight night sky um, so you can get that and shoot that before it gets too dark and get like a nice sort of soft blue milky way 
Um, I've used this trick a couple of times in places where the night sky, once it got dark, didn't really look that great, kind of all because of all the light pollution. But during twilight, it looked really nice and, and beautiful. Um, and again, another example of twilight um, with the Milky Way coming up behind a rock um, tower here out in, uh, in uh, Big Bend National Park. Moonlight is another thing you could use. I don't shoot a whole lot with moonlight because it does really wash out the night sky. But every once in a while, it's fun to try. And this one was shot, this is a panorama that was shot with the moon about 45 degrees up in the sky behind me. And I think it was about a half full moon, uh, you know, 50, uh, 50%. Um, so a lot of moonlight, and uh, I definitely wouldn't have done it at full moon. That would have been way too much moonlight. Probably would have completely wiped out the sky. But it was di just dim enough that through editing I could bring out the details in the stars here and get plenty of light on the foreground for just a sort of interesting, you know, moonlight effect on, on the riverbank there. And here's a mix of everything <laughs> going on in this photo. We've got light pollution, we're shooting at twilight, and there's moon glow coming up like the um the left part of the image here is bright because the sun had set not too long before you know it was still in twilight and this is summer way up in uh, canada and um so the nights are short up there anyway but we had um the twilight night sky with the uh, the sun not too far beyond the horizon on the left you've got the milky way arcing over the fjord here and that's all in twilight every, uh, as well, so the, mil the sky is blue. And then you've got this orange glow on the right side of the image beyond that, uh, on the other side of the fjord wall there where the Milky Way is coming up. And that's because the moon is rising just above the horizon on the other side of that cliff wall. Um, so that's why the sky is starting to turn orange there. And then, of course, you've got the town here in the fjord with all the town lights on lighting up the entire fjord. <laughs> so the, the fjord is lit up in that sort of orangey red color because of the light pollution of the town. So there's a lot of things going on here. And I was still able to get plenty of detail in the Milky Way in this shot. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about single shots earlier. I just want to show another example. Um, this is a single shot taken at 14 millimeters, F2.8, ISO 3200, and 10 seconds. Um, now I was doing a technique called star stacking, where you take a whole bunch of shots of the sky and then stack them for low noise. So that's why I was only using 10 seconds here, because the noise, even though it's a lot at only 10 seconds, it'll be wiped out later from, from the star stacking in software. But if you're doing, or truly just want to do a single shot without doing any other stuff, then you'd probably do a little bit longer than that, maybe 20 or 30 seconds, capture more light, get less noise, a little more star trailing, but um, it'll be way less noisy with, with that much more light. And you can see in this single shot, even at 10 seconds, there's a lot of detail in the foreground and the sky and the water reflection looks great. Um, you probably can't see though on the webinar here, but there's a lot of noise in the foreground and in the sky. The sky's not too bad, but the foreground definitely has a lot of noise going on. But if you're just making small prints, you're just posting on Instagram or stuff like that, you know, you can totally get away with, with single exposures if there's enough ambient light uh, on the foreground. There happened to be a camp light like a half a mile away or something like that on the other side of the cove here. That provided plenty of, of light, uh, even though it was so far away, it was a very bright camp light and provided plenty of light on the, uh, the foreground here, to, uh, even in only like 10 seconds. Um, so uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the details of, of shutter speed for the sky. So obviously we're limited in the shutter speed by the rotation of the Earth. Um, the longer the shutter speed, the more the stars will appear to trail. Um, so you may have heard of this thing called the 500 rule, which is you take the 35 millimeter focal length equivalent of the lens you're using uh, and divide that uh, into the number 500. And then that's supposed to give you a, you know, a roughly the amount of sh uh, seconds that you can use so that stars don't trail too much at that focal length. Um, that is maybe okay for tiny photos, but it is way outdated, and I highly recommend that you don't use that rule. Um, there is a much better way to do it. Um, you could literally just trial and error would be better than using the 500 rule. Just like try five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20, and see what you like. That would be way better than just use sticking to the 500 rule. Um, but there's a thing called the NPF rule, which is a um, formula for calculating the shutter speed. And it takes into account the focal length of the lens, the 
the camera you're using and the actual like size of the pixel sites on the camera, the rotation speed of the earth. And it comes up with a shutter speed that you can use to get pretty good, you know, like, like that you can use to get pinpoint spot stars for that focal length and lens uh, for that focal length and camera combination. And the NPF rule can be found online. You can just search for NPF rule, you know, shutter speed or whatever in Google, but you can also find it in photo pool, photo pills in the spot stars tool. Um, you'll be able to type stuff in there and get the, the shutter speed. I'll show you that here later. And for ISO, you're usually talking like ISO 3 to 6400. All right, so star stacking is something I've alluded to here. And the way star stacking works is that you take a whole bunch of exposures for the sky right in a row, same settings, and then you combine them later in software. That's what we call stacking. You stack them later in software. And it aligns and averages all the images so that the noise is very much smoothed out. And you get way, way low noise, uh, way lower noise and higher quality images with way more detail. Um, the end result is that the, the noise will be similar to that of a single exposure of the total combined shutter speed uh, of all the exposures that you took for your star stack. So let's say you took 10 shots and they're each 10 seconds each. That's 10 times 10, so 100 seconds of light. So the amount of noise, you know, the visible noise that you'd see in the image will be very similar as if you just held the shutter open for 100 seconds and captured that much light. But the benefit, of course, is that each exposure is only 10 seconds, so the stars aren't moving enough to trail, so you get the best of both worlds. You get low noise and pinpoint stars through this technique. Um, and a bonus, by using star stacking, you can get rid of airplanes, satellites, and hot pixels all pretty easily um, because it just the software will just get rid of hot pixels and satellites and airplanes for you because it's detecting anything in the sky that's that's not really a star it can you know it knows when the where the stars are and lines them up and then anything that's not in the same place between an image and the sky is probably not a star so it can just kind of get rid of them um, so it helps that way too um, uh, software you can use on the Mac, there's a program called Starry Landscape Stacker that'll do this, and on Windows there's a program called Sequator. These programs are specifically designed to support star stacking with landscapes in the image, so that they're smart enough so that you can tell them, like, here's the foreground, don't use the foreground in the star stacking, just star stack the sky. So otherwise, if you use a program that doesn't have this capability capability when it tries to align all the images it'll align the foreground with it and then they won't line up right because the stars are moving and the foreground's not um, you can do this in Photoshop too manually uh, it's a pain in the butt and it doesn't always work well and, and even when it does it's not sometimes not that great so I highly recommend using the other programs available that are designed for this um, so let's take a look at a couple examples here of what star stacking can get us so on the left here, we have an example of a 30 second exposure at 14 millimeters on a full frame camera. And on the right, we have an example of a 10 second exposure at 14 millimeters on a full frame camera. Now, I don't know how well this is going to show up in the you know, recorded webinar here, but we've got less noise in the left, but longer star trails for sure. And on the right, there's a whole lot more noise, but we've got pinpoint stars with no star trails. And I don't know, like I said, I don't know how well that's showing up in the video, but there's a lot more noise on the right and a lot less noise in the left, but you're getting star trails in the left and no star trails on the right. So we get the best of both worlds by using star stacking. So here's an example of on the left, we have a single 10 second exposure at f2.8 on a 14 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. And on the right, you have the star stacked result of taking 20 of those exposures and star stacking them. So 20 exposures taken one after the other. You have to actually take all 20 or 30 or 10 or 50 or whatever exposures and stack them. You can't just take one exposure and stack it in software. If you <laughs> try to align and stack and average one image, it's just going to average to back to itself. Um, so you need multiple images to do this. Um, so the, I don't like, again, I don't know how well this is showing up in the video, but on the left, very noisy. On the right, way less noise. Very clean and smooth. A lot more detail uh, in the night sky. You can actually tell what's kind of like a star and what's not noise in the, in the image on the right. So huge, huge benefit to using this technique called star stacking. 
low noise pinpoint stars great for your night sky images so i mentioned that photopills has a tool to calculate the npf rule so if you're not familiar with photopills it is an app available for ios and android devices basically a phone or tablet app um, it does all kinds of things and the most important thing about it is the planning tool that um, I'll show a little bit later but um, it also has this tool called the uh, spot stars tool that is um, allows you to calculate the shutter speed for your focal length um, and your camera that'll give you nice pinpoint stars and it supports the NPF rule it also has the 500 rule there for for giggles I guess you don't use it though um, when you use this tool uh, you want to make sure you specify the focal length that you're using and the camera that you're using. Um, the aperture doesn't really matter here for this calculation, but you want to make sure you set the right aperture just in case. And um, you want to make sure on the far right there it says accurate. You want to choose accurate as instead of default. Accurate will give you the most, uh, the shortest uh, shutter speed for those pinpoint stars, um, or the longest shutter speed that you can use to get <laughs> pinpoint stars before it trails too much. And as a general rule of thumb, I've often found that whatever it tells you here, you can usually fudge a bit, maybe go a couple seconds longer. Like this is telling me seven and three quarter seconds. So on a camera, I can only do like second increments. So I do eight seconds, or you can do 10 seconds, and like the trails will be hardly noticeable at all between eight and 10 seconds on like 14 millimeters. Um, but either way, you can take what this app tells you and plug it in and use that as your shutter speed for that particular focal length and camera for getting pinpoint stars. Now, just a, a quick note about star trackers. Um, if you're not familiar with these devices, they are, they allow you to um, take a very long shutter, uh, a very long exposure of the, of the sky, keeping everything perfectly sharp because it's a device that rotates the camera with the rotation of the Earth. So the camera tracks the sky, hence the name Star Tracker or Sky Tracker. And you can get really long exposures, very low ISO, long shutter speeds, really low noise. And these are essential for long focal lengths and telescopes where you just, the stars would move way too fast to not use a tracker to track the sky. Um, and you can use them with wide angle lenses, but they have a lot of drawbacks. They require polar alignment. So you have to usually be able to see the North star or the Southern star and line it up. Um, the foreground will be blurred, of course, because the thing's actually moving. So anything in the foreground, if you have a foreground in the image will be blurred. Um, it's extra gear to manage. It's you have to extra batteries, stuff to haul around and set up and carry with you. Um, and I, so I use one with my telescope if I ever bust that out, but I never use one with, with landscape astrophotography. And the biggest reason I don't is that you can get almost the same result just by using star stacking, the technique we just talked about. So if you use a star tracker for, you know, let's say 100 seconds and got nice pinpoint stars and low noise because it's a 100 second exposure, you could just use star stacking 10 shots, 10 seconds, and get a very similar result because it's 10 but times 10 is 100 seconds. Um, so I just don't find them necessary for, for wide angle landscape astrophotography, but they're essential for using with long focal lengths or telescopes. All right, let's talk a little bit more about, um, very particular camera settings, not just exposure settings. Um, the, there's a one very overlooked setting called your picture control or creative mode. It, it's going to depend on your camera, what it's actually called. On Nikons, I think it's called picture control. And what this does is it affects the, the JPEG preview that you see in the back of your camera after you take a photo. Um, obviously, you're going to shoot in RAW mode, but whatever you see in the back of your camera on the LCD or in the viewfinder LCD is a JPEG preview image. And any JPEG settings in the camera will be applied to that JPEG preview image. So if you have your picture control or creative mode or whatever it's called in your camera set to something like uh, portrait or vivid or landscape or whatever, what it's going to do is add a lot of contrast and saturation to that image. And it might look good um, during daytime images, but at night we have so little light and the exposures are often so dark that when it adds all that extra contrast, it's just going to like crush the image and you're going to have a hard time seeing what's actually in your image. image. I've seen um, workshop clients on, on, on my workshops take a 10 minute exposure and then they look at the JPEG preview in the back of the camera and they're like, what the heck's going on? It's like completely dark. There's like no nothing in the foreground. And it's only because 
they had their picture control or creative mode or whatever it was set to landscape or vivid or something like that. And once we changed it to normal or standard or flat or neutral, whatever the like kind of middle road is on your camera, um, then you can easily see what's in the foreground. It's just because it was adding too much contrast to the JPEG preview. So obviously you should raw, you want to turn off autofocus just so you don't, don't accidentally screw up the focus um, during the night. And um, you can disable high ISO noise reduction. That is a JPEG only feature anyway in most cameras. And I'd rather see what I'm actually getting in terms of noise. And if you enable that, you might be blurring out stars and stuff like that in the JPEG preview. So it's, you don't even need it on. It's also helpful when you're out on location to turn down the brightness of your monitor. Um, you know, the, the LCD on the back of your camera, um, you might have it up really high so you can see what's on the screen during the daytime, but at night, you know, that's going to blind you in the face probably. So you might want to turn that down. Um, rely on your histogram as well. You know, if it's if, if you're having trouble kind of judging from the exposure, you can just make sure that the if the sky is what you're shooting for star stacking, that your sky isn't pushed all the way against the left, left side of the histogram. And if you're taking a foreground shot, you want to make sure that the foreground, that the whole image, the whole histogram is pushed away from the left side at least a tiny bit or like isn't completely bunched up against it. Um, and as far as white balance goes, it doesn't really matter. These are raw files. White balance is just metadata with raw files. You can always adjust it in software, which you will absolutely do when you go to edit your photos. But I just leave my camera on daylight for, um, for night photography. And in really dark locations, it's kind of accurate because the only light in a really dark location is starlight um, and our star is the sun and that's our daylight <laughs> another uh, setting you might want to consider is long exposure noise reduction many cameras have this feature available it's basically in camera dark frame subtraction and what that means is that when this is enabled the camera will automatically take another shot with the exact same settings but with the shutter closed and what this does is that it, tr it takes literally a black frame that is basically just the electronic sensor noise in the image um, or from your sensor at that time. And then it'll take that black frame and look for the hot pixels in it and try to map them out from the original shot that it just took and then write out the final raw file with those hot pixels removed. And then depending on the camera, it works either really well or just kind of okay. But it can be very, very helpful. Um, but it does mean that, you know, your exposures now take twice as long. So if you're taking a 10 minute dark for a 10 minute foreground exposure in a really dark area, then that now takes 20 minutes, right? So you may decide to do it in software later, and but then you're sitting there in front of your computer <laughs> trying to get rid of hot pixels. And there's ways to do that that are um, more efficient than just clone stamping that I show in my masterclass videos. But um, if you have the time, you can just leave it enabled. But it is not. Uh, it's important to note it's not needed for star stacking. So if you're doing your star stacking shots, you know, like 10, 20 shots at 10 seconds each or whatever, you don't need it on for star stacking because the hot pixels will get will be removed through the star stacking process in software. But you can leave it on for your like foreground shots if you want. All right, so one of the next biggest questions I get asked other than like, will my camera work, of course, is how do you focus at night? Um, obviously it's in the dark, you can't really see well, your camera can't even see that well without capturing a long exposure, so how do you focus the lens? So if you're completely new to this, you might want to go out with your camera in the daytime and just try to find focus on something very far in the distance to confirm infinity focus on your lens. Do not rely on the um, infinity mark on your lens, it's most likely not accurate. It may be on some lenses, it may be on yours, but the age of the lens and like temperature and humidity and things like that can all affect how accurate that actually is. So it's always good to find focus on your lens every single night you go out because it could change a little bit from night to night. But you could go out during the daytime and find infinity and then just kind of like mark it on your lens or tape it down so, th so the focus ring doesn't move if you wanted to do it that way. Um, but if you're on site at night and you want to find focus, generally you would just put the camera into live view mode at the highest ISO, widest aperture, use the focal length you want to use to shoot. Don't, if you're using a zoom lens, don't zoom in and then focus and zoom out. It may not retain focus, even if your camera, even if your lens does say it will, it may not work right. And then you just try to find a really bright star in the center of your lens to get it nice and round and sharp. And there's a tool called a Batnov mask I'll talk about in a minute here that might make this process easier depending on your camera. So like I said, for focusing on site, you would put your camera into live view mode um, and try to find a star and turn the focus ring slowly until you get that star 
to look nice and round and, and small. The one trick to or thing to keep in mind is that if your focus ring is very far from infinity, then you're going to have trouble even finding a star in the first place. So you want to get it in the ballpark of infinity because if your focus ring is already way out of focus from infinity then and focus on something like really close to the lens, then the stars will be blurred completely out of focus. You won't even see them at all. So you want to start with the lens near infinity and then fine tune it from there to find the actual, what it truly should be for focus on your stars. Um, and some cameras have different assist uh, modes built in that can help you focus on the stars. I think there's some cameras even have a star focus mode where it'll like you can pick a star and it'll try to get it as sharp as possible. Um, some cameras have uh, you know highlights or focus highlights, focus peaking. Um, and on if you're using a Nikon camera like the Nikon Z7, Z6, the Z7 II, Z6 II, that kind of camera, and there's a trick where you can uh, use video mode actually to get a much uh, better preview of the scene. So this means that you would put the camera, instead of in photo mode, you'd flip it into, uh, flip that switch in the back of the camera to video mode, like you're going to take a video, use the highest ISO and the longest shutter speed available in that mode, but it'll boost the video feed significantly beyond what it does in normal photo mode, so that you can really, like, way easy, way more easily see what you're doing. And if it's too noisy, just drop the ISO back a bit. But this, uh, this is how I use, um, how I get focus on my Nikon cameras now, is by doing that trick of putting into video mode and then and um, getting focused and then putting it back into photo mode when I want to take a picture. Another, th so like I mentioned briefly, there's a thing called a Batnov mask that um, if you have trouble getting focused at night, um, you may consider investing in a Batnov mask, which is a device that goes in front of the lens and it diffuses the light from the stars so that um, when the star is focused, you get these these three spikes here, as you'll see in the in the right part of the image here. Um, that means that the, the lens is in focus on a star. And there are, the, the Batnov masks that are generally made are these kind of big things that look like, uh, like a funny looking tennis racket or something with big slats in them. And they're, um, more for, uh, long focal lengths, like telephoto lenses or telescopes. They do not work for wide angle lenses because the slats are just way too big and far apart. You need a device that is designed specifically for star diffraction on a wide angle lens if you want to use a Batonov mask with a wide angle lens. In my book there's one I mentioned called um, Sharp Star 2, but that's plastic. And since that book came out there's a new device on the market that is etched glass that is much higher quality than that device. It's This new device is called Focus on Stars. It's a Batonov mask you put in front of your wide angle lens and you'll get a much better view. Um, of the stars at wide angles and at, at one, on wide angle lenses and actually be able to see the uh, diffraction spikes more easily. It's still not um, that, you know, visible. Like the, the example you see here is from a photo taken with a Batonov mask. Um, the actual live view image that you'll see is going to be a little different um, and a little more patient, patience will be required to use it. But It'll be a lot easier than the plastic mask from the other company. If you decide that you need one of these devices, you can use the coupon code here over at focusonstars.com to get 5% off. And like I said, uh, I, I don't use one personally. Um, most of the time I have this device and to test, um, especially if I'm having trouble one night on a particular night for some reason getting focus, or if I'm using a different lens that I haven't used before, I'll use it to confirm focus. Um, but I've been doing it so long that I just, I can get it, uh, get the stars in focus on a wide angle lens just by trial and error, usually just by doing it myself. But this is a very handy device and I, I find it very handy for longer focal length lenses where you might be shooting at a much faster aperture and like the, <laughs> the sweet spot of being in focus is really shallow. Like it's really hard to find and get perfect and a Batonov mask will make it much easier to find that. Um, so anyway... Uh, moving on from there, uh, focusing on the foreground. Um, if you're tap taking separate foreground shots, you know, you take your sky shots and then you need a separate foreground shot possibly depending on how dark the area is. Um, if you do this, you want to make sure that if you're, that the fo focus on that foreground shot, at least one of the foreground shots, if you're using focus stacking, um, is the same focus that you're using for the stars. That means that you want the horizon of the foreground to be line up with the horizon of the star shots. That'll make blending way easier later when you take those star shots that you've, you know, done your star stacking or whatever, and you take the result of that, 
and then you want to blend it with your 10 minute or two minute or whatever it is a foreground exposure if the horizon lines up like the trees or the mountains or whatever it is that's on the horizon lines up between those images it'll be way easier to blend them so if you're going to do separate foreground exposures make sure that at least one of those images has the same focus as the stars it'll make it way easier to blend and then if you need to uh, bring focus in for focus stacking to get things in the foreground in better focus then you can do that but always make sure you get the um the horizon from the star image and the and the foreground image at least one of the foreground images to be line up with the horizon from the star image um in general for separate foreground exposures i'm usually using like iso 1600 or so you know just less than you'd use for the sky you don't need it that high um, usually at the largest aperture of the lens and like I said it can be anywhere between one and ten minutes you know it just depends on how how much light there is in the area you're at um, I usually find that I don't need any more than ten minutes even in a really dark area but you might need as little as one minute because there's a lot of ambient light from a lighthouse or something like that or even less than that in this particular shot here this is an example of a very long foreground exposure where I was looking into this uh, little gully here, this, you know, gorge um, on a moonless night in the middle of the woods, um, dark area. So there's no, like, hardly any ambient light getting in there. I tried light painting just for the heck of it, which is like literally shining a flashlight in there, which was a terrible idea. And this was back when I was kind of early in my night photography uh, days and was still kind of playing with that idea. But I just looked terrible. The water looked really strange. There's weird shadows, highlights that that made you know because the water all the rocks are wet so they were just very shiny with light on them so i just bit the bullet and said well i'll just take a 20 minute exposure and see how that works because it's really dark and it worked out great um and i had dark frame on you know long exposure noise reduction so of course that 20 minute foreground exposure ended up being 40 minutes but these days i probably could get away with just 10 minutes you know, the cameras have gotten better with noise and everything like that you know um so i probably would have just doing 10 minutes these days all right, let's talk a little bit about planning. Um, so up here in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way core is visible from roughly February until October, November, roughly like that. Um, throughout the year, it'll move east to west. Um, and throughout the night, it's always moving west throughout the night. And early in the year, it's very low on the horizon, very flat. And then later in the year, it's, it's like straight up and down um, in like in the middle of the summer and after that. And it'll start kind of like this early in the year and then gradually go like that towards the end of the year. It's an example of what I'm talking about here, where in February, we have an example of the Milky Way over a lighthouse here, and it's very flat in the sky. That's in February. And then by September, or even by July and August, the Milky Way, um, at some point in the night, is basically straight up into the sky. So keep that in mind as you look for different compositions throughout the year. The Milky Way orientation will change. And then in the winter, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, from like... You know, November through most of February, we don't see the galactic core of the Milky Way. So that's sort of like, you know, the non-Milky Way season up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Down in the Southern Hemisphere, things are a little bit different because the Milky Way core is visible almost all year, except for, I think, December and part of January. And the core can be much higher in the sky. And by mid-year down in, Northern, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's directly overhead. The core itself, not just the Milky Way, but the core itself, the big bright part that we like to photograph. So you can get very, very different images down in the Southern Hemisphere. This is not a Southern Hemisphere image. I don't have any from the Southern Hemisphere, but you can get very different compositions down there. Um, for planning shots, like I mentioned earlier, I use PhotoPills. Um, but there are other apps available that do similar planning, uh, such as uh, the Photographer's Ephemeris, also called TPE. Planet Pro and some other apps. Um, these basically allow you to do planning on a 2D map um, of any spot in the world, and you can go on any time, any date. So you can figure out where the Milky Way will be, what, what how high it'll be in the sky, what's the orientation be like at you know someplace in Utah, you know next fall or whatever, just by using this app, right? Um, and it also works for daytime. You know you can see where the sun and moon will be. Um, but it does have Milky Way features in it. This app or any app like it is essential for doing Milky Way planning. Um, it makes it so much easier to figure out where to go to shoot the Milky Way before you actually get there. And then once you're actually there, you can use augmented reality to figure out the exact location or pretty darn close to exactly where the Milky Way will be that night. Or even like, you know, six months in the future, if you're at a location where the Milky Way doesn't line up right then you could see well what's it going to be like a few months down the road maybe i'll come back 
So this is called Augmented Reality, and it's available in most of those apps, not just photo pills. And it basically lets you use your camera, live view on your phone camera, that is, not your camera camera, your phone camera, to look at the location through the um, screen of your camera, the screen of your phone, and then overlay the stars and the Milky Way on top of that. So you'll see where the Milky Way will be in orient, uh, in uh oriented over the, the foreground, whatever it is that you're looking at. So you can figure out where you want to be over that particular rock or mountain or tree or whatever it is that you're shooting, you know. Um, very, very handy, and I use it all the time. Okay, folks, so we have gone through all kinds of stuff. Um, talked about, you know, camera gear, exposure settings, camera settings, a little bit about planning and everything. So I hope you learned a lot here. This is, and then, then you've, so you've got to put it all together, of course. Um, into the uh, the software side of things, and um, my workflow processing workflow uh, involves uh, star stacking the raw files of the sky shots in my stacking program, which I use a Mac, so I use Starry Landscape Stacker. On Windows, you'd use Sequator. Um, then you do raw image prep for all the foreground shots. So this is like white balance, lens corrections, exposure corrections, etc., for the foreground shots in your raw editor. And then you would take the resulting star stacked image and the um, foreground images and blend them, bring them into Photoshop to do the final blending to create the final image. And then you apply creative edits on top of that. So that's my, my overview of my workflow. And this is all um, laid out in uh, very, very high level, uh, in a lot of detail in my Milky Way Masterclass video tutorials. Um, which contain, uh, the masterclass itself contains two different modules. There's the editing workflow module, which shows you how to prepare, blend, and edit the photos. And there's the exposure blending module, which goes over a whole bunch of different, uh, just exposure blending examples. But the editing workflow is the start to finish. Here's how I do all my steps to create my final images, from star stacking to, ex to white balance, to exposure blending, creative edits, noise reduction, hot pixels, all that stuff. That's in the editing workflow part of the masterclass. Um, so the masterclass editing workflow, just a little more detail, has all that stuff I just talked about in it. It's got, um, there's example files included for the image you see here on the left. The masterclass um, goes over everything I do to create the image on the left, and it, includes, and it includes example files that you can use to follow along with on your own for star stacking and exposure blending and doing all the other editing techniques. You've got the example files with you when you download it. Um, so here's the sky image that's included there. So we've got the sky, the foreground, and the final edit. Those are the separate components that have gone through in the editing uh, part of the masterclass, and it shows you how everything works. Um, there's other, a few other creative editing techniques thrown in there, like here's an example of a before and after of just uh, some creative editing techniques to really make the sky pop and bring out detail in the stars. Um, so you can see on the left, the raw image straight out of camera on the right just adding a few creative edits to really bring out the detail in the milky way and make it really pop and sing that's shown in the master class as well um and then there's the exposure blending module that's also part of the master class that teaches you different exposure blending techniques in photoshop this is all designed for lightroom and photoshop the whole master class um but primarily the work in the exposure blending module is all in photoshop um, you could apply these techniques to other editors, though. Like, you can apply the Lightroom techniques to um, Capture One or um, Luminar or whatever program you're using. But a lot of the exposure blending techniques, the advanced ones, some of those advanced techniques are only available in Photoshop because last time I checked, like Affinity Photo, which is a competing program to Photoshop, didn't have all the tools you needed to do this. Um, but you can still try to apply those techniques to other programs. But the exposure blending module teaches you about exposure blending techniques in Photoshop for getting, you know, um, blends that look real and natural without seams and ugly halos and stuff like that. Um, it, call, it goes through basic layer mask and hand blending to advanced blending with a selecting mask tool. Um, it goes over uh, um, focus stacking with a dedicated focus um, stacking program called Helicon Focus, if you ever have to run into that situation where you're stacking flowers at night. Um, there are six different blending examples, and again, all example files are included um, with that. So when, when you download, you have all the example files to follow along with. This is an example of the uh, of one of the exposure blending um, examples. You've got the sky, the foreground, and after exposure blending, you see what's uh, the result on the right there. So you has like a seamless sort of natural blend. Looks like a um, you know you don't have ugly halos and blend lines there, making it look very obvious that you blended the photos. 
Um, this is an example of the focus stacking uh, photo that's shown in the in the in the master class uh, on a field of lupins, focus stacked, and then the sky image separately, and then using helicon focus to the focus stacking, and then blending that result with the sky result to create the final image. Um, and these are all six examples that are in the exposure blending module of the master class. And you get example files for all of these and, and get to follow along with all the techniques that I use to do the exposure blending part of all of this. And so just as a huge thank you for sitting through this uh, webinar and, and filling your brain with everything night photography. Um, for the next 30 minutes, basically from now, if you click on the offer link here, for 30 minutes, you'll have the chance to take um, advantage of the special offer to get the master class, plus a couple free bonus videos for a super low price. Um, normally, the master class by itself is 197, and it's like seven hours of video training. But I'm throwing in uh, two bonus videos here. There's one that is a photo pills training video. It's basically a, a recorded webinar of me teaching photo pills. That's usually $45 by itself. There's another. Um, recorded webinar of me uh, going over Milky Way panoramas, which is a webinar similar to this, but talking about Milky Way panoramas and all the specific panorama hardware and gear you might want to use. And that includes a demo of this program called PT GUI, which is the, the top end, top of the line um, panorama um, stitching program that you would want to use for doing serious panorama stitching. There's a demonstration of that in that second bonus. So altogether, this is like some crazy amount of like eight hours of training or something like that. Normally, it'd be $287 for all of that work, all of that training. But for um, the next 30 minutes, you can get it for only $97. You can get all that stuff. Um, like I said, the first bonus is a uh, recorded webinar of photo pills going over planning, how to plan Milky Way, but also day, night, moon um, shots with photo pills um, in a recorded webinar format. Um, that's the first bonus that you get with this. And then the second bonus is that PT GUI and Panoramas webinar where I go over everything you need to know for how to shoot Milky Way panoramas. And that's where you're capturing the Milky Way arcing across the sky and uh, taking a whole bunch of shots and stitching them together. And at the end of that, there's a demonstration of doing the stitching in uh, Lightroom a little bit and then showing some of the shortfalls of Lightroom and then showing it in uh, PT GUI and the super like the crazy amazing stuff that you can do in PT GUI. Um, so I'm going to just throw up the, um, I'm just going to play the Milky Way uh, Masterclass preview video here for you folks. Hello, I'm Adam Woodworth, and I'm excited to announce a major update to my Milky Way Masterclass. This update includes an entirely new editing workflow demonstration covering my latest tools and techniques that I use to create Milky Way images with low noise and seamless natural looking blends, as well as many creative editing techniques to really make your images pop. This class begins with the editing workflow demonstration which covers every step in detail, starting with star stacking and starry landscape stacker on Mac or sequator on Windows, preparing separate foreground exposure raw files, easily removing hot pixels, focus stacking, exposure blending, and creative edits, including how to really make the Milky Way pop by using curves, dodging and burning, and reducing the size of the stars to bring out the nebulosity of the galactic core. We'll also cover how you can use star stacking with mirror-like reflections, and how you can use star stacking to avoid separate foreground exposures when the scene has a lot of ambient light. The workflow module also includes a demonstration of how I have incorporated Capture One into my editing workflow to easily remove most hot pixels from RAW files without the need for using in-camera long exposure noise reduction. After the workflow module, we would jump into an in-depth module on exposure blending. This comprehensive video series covers six different examples of blending separate night sky and foreground exposures to create a final result with low noise and sharp focus for the entire scene. We will cover basic blending with the gradient tool before jumping into using the select and mask panel to create accurate masks for very realistic blends that don't have seam lines or halos, as well as using selections to control manual blending for a tricky scene with trees blowing in the wind, a bright ambient light scene from a lighthouse, and an example of complex focus stacking using Helicon Focus, a dedicated focus stacking tool. This masterclass will teach you advanced editing and blending techniques for getting dramatic, realistic-looking results. Visit adamwoodworth.com to learn more and to purchase this class. 
Okay, folks, if you want to take advantage of that special offer, head over to adamwoodworth.com slash offer. For the next 30 minutes, you'll be able to take advantage of all that training goodness for only $97. And thanks for tuning in to this webinar. I really appreciate it. I hope you learned a ton of information. Um, you can go back and watch this webinar at any time and uh, watch it over and over again if you need to to learn everything. And I hope you look forward to getting out under the stars uh, in the near future and practicing everything and capturing some of your own Milky Way masterpieces. So good luck, everybody, and happy shooting.